I don't see it. Genesis 23. Now this is one of those chapters that you read it and go, huh, and then you move on. But there's no mistakes with God's word. There's no, uh, there's no just fill in material. There are no vain words in God's word. In other words, words that don't really mean a whole lot. Some people are of the idea that if a place in the Bible, like a verse or a chapter, if all it does is talk about who begat who, and this and that and the other, well then if there's mistakes in the Bible, then that doesn't really affect anything. But I'm of the opposite opinion. Who thinks it's a good idea to genetically alter mosquitoes and release them in Florida? Because we don't know yet exactly what kind of alteration that will do. You see, there are other animals in this world that eat mosquitoes. But they have to know that they're mosquitoes. How will they know? Um, they're talking about bees. And how all of a sudden a lot of bees are missing. There's not enough honeybees. Okay. Well, there are predators that, that prey on bees. If you alter a bee, see bees, animals seek their prey a lot of times by temperature or by sniffing out certain chemicals that are emitted from different creatures. Um by smell of some kind or whatever. And if you alter certain genes, is it possible you might be altering how that bee smells to a predator? And if it don't smell right, I mean, if you try to give your dog a worm pill, will he eat it? Why? It don't smell right. It smells like a chemical. They don't, they're not going to eat it. So anyway, I just don't think you ought to be messing with stuff. In Genesis 23, leave it alone. Read it. If you don't get anything out of it right then, wait on the Lord. Then go back a year later, six months later, and read it again. Who knows? You may have learned something by then. You know what I'm going to do? I want to turn some air on. Is that all right? Instead of the furnace. Ah. There we go. Now we're cooking with ice. Alright, let's, let's read Genesis 23. It's not a big chapter. But it deals with something. Something important. Genesis, I'm in Exodus. Genesis 23. And Sarah was an hundred and seven and twenty years old. So not only does she have a child at ninety, but she lives now thirty-seven years after the after Isaac is born. So she gets to see Isaac grow up. She doesn't get to see him married because Isaac doesn't marry until he's forty. But she does get to see this child of promise grow up and live to be a man. So probably she's satisfied in the Lord that God is going to keep his promise. Here she is, 90 years old, giving birth to a child. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. Kirjath Arba is named after who? Arba has his name in it. Arba. And who was Arba? A giant. He was a giant. Anyway, the same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. Jesus visited Hebron. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. How long would they have been married, do you think? About 
80 some odd years, something like that. That's a long time. Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron. Verse 3, And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth. Heth is the father of the Hittites. They were of the land in Canaan. Saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I might bury my dead out of my sight. Uh, a lot of people argue about how the practice of burying the dead actually came into existence. Well, it, I believe it comes biblically from the scriptures. I believe God instilled it into man. That you take a human dead body and you bury it or plant it in the ground. In this case, uh, sepulchers tended to be caves, especially for those who had certain amount of wealth. Now, if you were just uh, a poor person, uh, then more than likely you were you were going to be disposed of in some sort of pauper's grave, even all the way back then, where basically it was just a great big hole dug in the ground and everybody that died that couldn't afford anything else, they were tossed in there. Uh, I'm not sure when they started putting lime on the bodies. What does the lime do? Huh? Yeah, it causes the decomposition to take place faster, is what it does. Uh, Mozart was buried in a pauper's grave. A common grave there with who knows how many bodies. And that was it, because he'd squandered all of his money. Um, but anyway, that I might bury my dead out of my sight. In other words, Abraham has now come to the place where he realizes Sarah's gone. He's, she's not coming back to him. He will go to her one of these days, but she will not come to him. And so he is ready for closure. I, I absolutely, my heart goes out to anybody who loses a loved one by someone ending up missing and them not ever Finding the body. Gina Dawn Brooks comes to mind. Rose, down at Fredericktown. To this day, they have no idea what has even happened to her, much less who did what. And that's been, what, 35, 35 years, something like that, when she was ended up missing? Have no idea where she is, what happened, who did what. And to not be able to have any closure... I mean, God gives us that as a, as a way to just say, okay, we're, we're, this part of our life, as bad as we hate it, this part of our life is over. And, it, and slowly but surely, you have to walk on and move on away from it. Okay? And this chapter really is, to me, the first big reminder in the Bible. That death comes to everybody. And that everybody is going to have to deal with death sooner or later, one way or another. We have to learn to deal with it. He's got to put her out of his sight so that he can move on. Let me ask you a question. Does Abraham get married again after this? Anybody? Everett? <laughs> Everett's going, what's the question? The answer is yes. He does. Um, so anyway, verse 5, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. They recognize Abraham's status not just with the people that he's with. They see, number one, his riches. The number of cattle that he has. The number of servants that he has. The, the big tent that he lives in. 
He not only sees all that, and they know him by that reputation, but I believe that they knew the God that Abraham served was the mightiest God. And they knew not to mess with Abraham. That's what they knew. They knew, they probably heard the story of how Abraham took his servants after the war in Sodom and rescued Lot and all of his family and all of his things and servants and everything like, rescued Lot and fought off those people to win Lot back. And they're going, uh, this is a guy, whatever he asked, give it to him. So he had that respect even among the heathen. Um, Thou art a mighty prince among us, and the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. In other words, take, uh, Abraham, take your pick. Any one that you want is fine. Um, and Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land. That is Abraham's humility. Abraham displayed that with Lot back in Genesis 13, when Abraham could have said, Lot, uh, all of this is mine. What are you talking about? Our servants are fighting. If your servants are fighting my servants, then your servants have a problem, don't they? Go find your own land. But he didn't do that. He told Lot, you take your pick of whichever you want. And I'll go the opposite way. And that's when God took him and said, Abraham, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. All that thine eyes shall see, I shall give unto thee and to thy seed forever. And it's the same thing here. By God's grace... God has bestowed favor on Abraham. And remember the curse that God made. Back in Genesis 12, God said, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse curseth thee. And it's quite possible that the Hittites and all the inhabitants of that land knew of that blessing and that curse, and they're like, we're not going against Abraham. We're smart and we want to be blessed with righteous Abraham. And so they know better because they're dealing with God. Now, had, had these people, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Had these people harassed or molested Abraham and his people in any way? I think God would have got them. And then Abraham could have really had his pick of whatever, because there wouldn't have been none of them left alive. In verse 8, he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah. You might want to underline that. Is Sarah the only person to be buried in the cave of Machpelah? Does anybody know that one? Who else is buried in the cave of Machpelah? Who else? Sarah. Abraham. Isaac. Jacob. And Joseph. That's why he said to the Israelites, when, not if, Joseph knew they were going to be taken out of Egypt back into their land. And he said, you got to promise me one thing. When I die, you make sure my bones are carried to the burying place of my fathers. Okay? Which was the cave of Machpelah. Uh, which he hath... Uh, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of this field. For as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. Now, even though they're offering this to Abraham, he's still offering to pay, and he does pay. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience, of Heth, because this is uh, Ephron's land, I believe. Yeah, this is Ephron's land. 
He answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein, I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people, give I it thee, bury thy dead. Now he's being offered a free burying place. Um, I know several of the funeral directors around here, obviously, and um, I, I don't think I've ever done this, but I would say uh, just a word of appreciation to uh, Todd Mann of Mann Funeral Home. Uh, he owns that cemetery out on 110 where Adeline is, our granddaughter. And uh, Todd donated that little parcel for us. Uh, that blessed me a lot. It's a little child. It's a, there's an area there. It's just infant babies. Some stillborn, some that lived a little while after birth. And um, he donated that to our family. And, and I, I appreciate that. Um, so Ephron is willing to give this to Abraham as a gift. And Abraham bowed himself before the people of the land, and he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. Now there's a number. The number 400. What does that number mean? What does that number mean? It represents the gospel. 400 also represents the spiritual realm. Okay? So, and the fact that it's in a cave, caves, ditches, pits, any kind of hole that goes down into the ground, to me is a way of describing the way to the lower parts of the earth, okay, like the bottomless pit. And in the lower parts of the earth, before Christ died on the cross, there were two sections. What were they? Anybody know? Two divided sections. Huh? Abraham's bosom was on one side of a gulf, an expanse. What was the other side? Where the rich man went. Hell. So, I, I, you know, I heard all kinds of things. Being in Bible college, being around other preachers throughout my life. Who had all kinds of theories. Um, one preacher I know, he said something about Jesus going to hell for three days and three nights. Because the question came up in, in a church service here years ago when I was young. Uh, where, did, where did Jesus go during the three days? And one man said, and I, I love him to death, but he said he went to hell for three days. Well, that's only partially true. We know there were two divisions in the lower part of the earth. You have hell fire, which all of the wicked and those who died without faith, that's where they went to immediate suffering, okay? If you get arrested, Cubby, and can't make bail on a Class A felony, do they just let you out, ROR, R&R, &R, own recognizance? Negative. No, negative. You got to stay and eat stale bologna until trial, right? 
That's how you got to understand. That's how my brother-in-law Steve described Jefferson County's hotel. Was it was hard bread and green bologna three times a day. Now that may be what got him on his knees asking Jesus to get out. Amen. But even so be it. Amen. But anyway, upon death, understand, you don't just get to hang around and watch how everybody lives their life. You're either going to the hell fire and are in torments until judgment day or... Before Christ died, you go to a place, watch this, that was purchased. Amen? This, see, this is why I think Abraham said, ah, no, it's, it's not a gift. I'm paying for it. I'm buying it. That way it could never ever be said, well, you took Zohar's or you took Ephron's gravesite for his family. Even though there was witnesses around. And even back then, I'm reasonably sure that some sort of bill of sale was written up. You find that in the book of Jeremiah. When Jeremiah is going to purchase his uncle, his cousin's land, they wrote up two copies of the bill of sale. One was open and that was for... Uh, Jeremiah to have his proof and another one was sealed and stored probably in a hall of record somewhere or put in an earthen vessel so that if anybody questioned it they had the original sealed copy in there to show this is Jeremiah's property now he bought it 17 shekels of silver and so I think I think my best guess on this is this is a reference to the, the spiritual picture of Abraham's bosom, even though being in the lower parts of the earth, is still a place of comfort. There's no torture there. There's no screaming and gnashing of teeth. There's no gnawing their tongues for pain. They're in, uh, like I said, when you hold somebody, either a baby or Everett back here, Everett's just eating. Grandma Betty up. In church, that's his favorite place to sit. Where is he sitting, by the way? In her bosom. Okay? He's getting comforted back there. By, that's why he won't sit back there. Now, if he sits by me all during church, I'm poking him, jabbing him, and stabbing him. And No, I'm not. In there. He won't want to sit by me no more. But no, he's enjoying that. And that's where we find Lazarus. In Abraham's bosom. That place was a place of comfort. Why? These people all died in faith. But they, they had not been able to see what it was that they were waiting on. Not until Jesus came and set captivity free. Okay? So I liken the cave of Machpelah to the lower part, by this number 400, to the lower part of the earth. And a purchase is made, a place for God's people, God's saints to dwell for another 2,000 years. Okay? Uh, so in the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was, uh, well, let me back up here. Verse 16. Yeah, the, verse 15. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury thy, therefore bury thy dead. And I like how both Abraham, um, the children of Heth, and Ephron are being humble in this negotiation. Folks, when, and, and I just, when, when I talk about covetousness, bear that in mind if you ever have to negotiate for something. There's nothing wrong in negotiation per se. Okay? Two parties can come to a mutual beneficial agreement where both 
parties are benefited. But we don't see it that way sometimes, like when we're buying a car or we're buying anything where the price, you know the price is not fixed. We don't care if that guy ends up with any money or not. In fact, he don't deserve it. Get out and get another job. I'll get what I want out of this. But that's, that's not being humble. That's being greedy. When you negotiate with people, follow Abraham. Remember, they were willing to give it to him. Would that have been fair and equitable? No. And Abraham, he had the money. He was pretty wealthy. And he's going, well, I'm not just going to take your land. I didn't come here to just steal your land. If it's worth 400 shekels, that's what I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay 400 shekels. We'll write it up. We have all these witnesses around us so that everybody will know this was done in the right way way and in the right spirit you even have lost people the heathen you have Ephron here you have the children of Heth here you have all of these people who eventually their offspring is going to be killed by the Israelites and yet Abraham is dealing uh, meek in a meek manner with them what did Paul say when he's talking about you go to law against somebody, especially another brother. Paul said, I'd rather take the loss than for me and another, who, somebody whom I know to be a Christian, to end up in an earthly court somewhere fighting some piddly nonsense out. I don't know for sure, but I'm reasonably sure knowing American Christians long enough to know that I'm reasonably sure probably somebody has tried to sue a church wanting their tithe money back uh, we had a situation one time where a family put their daughter in our school and I don't remember if we decided that we couldn't take her or they decided they weren't going to put her in here. They had already paid the deposit. And um, a deposit generally holds something and it says, this is what we're going to do. But they with, I'm pretty sure they withdrew. They pulled their student back and they said, well, we want our deposit. And we said, we don't give the deposit back. And I got a pretty mean phone call one day and I said, I'm sorry, but we just don't give the deposit back. And me and some guys at the church here were working. We were putting drywall up there in that balcony room up there years ago. And this girl's daddy came in. Now he's about 10 feet taller than me. Great big old arms. He was a drywall hanger. And he come in. Now this guy is supposed to be a born again Pentecostal Christian. And he comes in looking down his nose at me with a mean look. And he says, I want my deposit back. Now, right here, in, right here in this room, right here, right there. And I stood there looking at him for a minute, biting my tongue. And I said, Rose, write the man a check. And I turned around and walked off. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I was in the right and he wasn't. But it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Treat people better than they deserve to be treated. Because you never know. It might be you next. Amen? So anyway... Um, and Abraham, verse 16, hearkened unto Ephron, and Abram weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field that were in all the borders round about were made sure. In other words, they marked them. This is your land. 
unto Abraham for possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah with uh, his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure. Look at this. Were made sure unto Abraham for possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. Now that's the end of the chapter. And, and it's past four o'clock and I'm not going to get into much more tonight. But that last verse really is what convinces me that this is talking about much more than just a cemetery plot for Sarah. Uh, Brother Sterling told me uh, they've got some family, Gloria's dad and I think uh, her, da her dad's um, wife at the time she died and I think maybe her mom are buried in this cemetery. I think it's up on, way up on Lime Ferry, close to St. Louis. I may be wrong about that, but I know they've got, I know in that big cemetery, back in 1950 something, Sterling and Gloria bought burial plots for themselves, or maybe the early 60s. They bought two burial plots next to each other. I think, I don't remember how much they paid, like $500 for both of them. That was back in the, you know, 50 some odd years ago. Well, they got a, a letter from the company that manages that cemetery and says, okay, yes, you've got your two burial plots. You paid your money for them. However, there's like a $600 per person opening fee that we have to charge you. In other words, we know you bought it, but you're going to buy it again. And he's going, they ain't getting that out of me, I'll tell you that right now. I said, Sterling, I can start working on a place down here behind, behind the house if you want. And I told him, I said, you know, you probably go over here to Sandy Baptist Cemetery and for less than $600 buy a new plot. They're just, they're just getting it, you know, getting him. And he's got, he's all worked up over that. But um, here's the thing. The field, the cave that is therein were made sure. In other words, listen to this. Abraham knew where he was going when he died. You understand that? How many of you are sure you know where you're going when you die. And how do you know? It's been bought and paid for. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. See, that was fun. You would have skipped that chapter. That's uh, Sarah's dead. Okay. Let's get into the begatting. That's more interesting. I'm telling you, don't skip the little details. Details will tell you what it's about. As soon as I saw that number 400, I'm going, that's got to mean something. Heart of the earth. One, two, three, four. Okay? And so now that Abraham's purchased it, Sarah gets to go there for free. Isaac gets to go there for free. Jacob gets to go there for free. Joseph gets, they all get to go for free because the price has already been paid. Amen. Father, oh Lord, even the smallest details, Father, carry with it the story of the gospel. Lord, I would just love for anybody who hears my voice to know beyond any shadow of a doubt where they're going to spend eternity. When they die, where are they going? And Lord, just as there were two choices in Abraham's day, in David's day, in Solomon's day, 
hellfire or Abraham's bosom. People have two choices now. Hellfire or heaven's pearly gates. Lord, there is nothing in this world that is worth going to hell for. No amount of money, no amount of pleasures, no amount of earthly things are worth losing my soul for. So, Father, I stand with everybody else. God, help us to learn how to forsake this world. Being willing to give it all up. Just so that we can have eternal life. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.